So if you want to, you know, raise a hand or ask something, there's a participants button in Zoom, which if you're on a laptop is kind of towards the bottom of the screen um, or on a tablet or iPhone, there should be a participants tab. And then within that, there's a little button that says raise hand. And so that's the kind of way to get Meron's attention um, or myself. And also I'll, I'll make um, Angela and Kip co-hosts as well. So you'll be able to post things in the, in the chat as well, which is another button at the bottom of the screen. You can hit a little chat thing there. Um, but with that, I'll hand over to uh, Mary Muxlow, uh, the president, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get underway. Oh, we, yeah, before I do that, Mary, I was going to say I did do a little agenda thing. The main part of it in the program after we do elected officials and then Q&A and then finish up about 5.30. Yeah, Perfect. I'll hand over to you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, and welcome. We have a great program um, for you today. Um, so, uh, and thank you. Uh, I see lots of members, and um, thanks, John, for fixing my name also. <laughs> 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 No, I'm, I'm not Amanda Pillow. That's my, my I'm using my friend's uh, laptop. We were at the beach uh, earlier today and we wanted to get a little bit of uh, um, extra boogie boarding time. So I just used her computer instead of mine since we're nearer to her house. Um, so uh, I'm going to call us to order. Uh, we, uh, it's uh, 4.02 and we are being recorded. <laughs> so 4.02 uh, being called to order. Um, any uh, elected officials, candidates, um, or um, guests uh, that would uh, give your statements, um, you are up. You may unmute yourself and go. Uh, Doug, did you want to? Did you want to go? Um, you know, actually, the uh, Senate has been in recess since the last uh, meeting, so there's not really a lot to report. They go back into session on Monday, and they have hundreds of bills to consider before they adjourn on August 31st, so I'll have a more full report next time. Um, I didn't notice anybody else in the queue in terms of uh, being an elected or um, running for office or representatives. Um, if there is anybody else that would like to go as an elected, an elected. So, so Marin, yeah, you've oh, got, I'm, Nora's got a hand raised. Nora, yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually, I'm not Nora. Um, I'm her campaign coordinator, but um, I'm here on her behalf. If I could just make a quick announcement. Um, so yeah, my name is Jasmine. Um, and Nora Vargas, as a lot of you guys know, is running for District 1 uh, for the County Board of Supervisors. And um, as you know, like we are running a very progressive campaign and we need your guys' help to make that um, a reality. So any monetary donation, if you guys can, from $5 to 100, anything, you know, really can make a huge difference for the campaign. Um, and it's much appreciated. Um, we also have phone banking available too, if that's another way you'd rather get involved. You could also help meet and greets um, with you and your friends. It's kind of like a fundraiser activity and there's tons of ways to get involved. I'll drop two links below. One is for monetary donations and then the other one is to donate your time. Thank you guys so much. Th thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, thanks so much. Next up, yeah, next up we've got uh, Michelle. Michelle, I'll unmute you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as your regional director for Area 20, we are still doing the California Democratic Party, as John said. And I did want to thank you, John, for the link. Um, we're uh, going over a ton of legislation and a ton of propositions. So just giving everyone a heads up, there are 12 propositions um, on the upcoming ballot in November. Um, very quickly, number uh 15 proposition 15, 16, 17, and 18 have been particularly, um, we in San Diego have been particularly involved in those. 15 is the schools and communities first. 16 is the um, ACA5 that Dr. Shirley Weber did so that we can now use affirmative action, assuming that it gets passed uh, throughout California. That was taken away from us when Proposition 209 got passed 25 years ago. And then um, the 15, 16, 17 will be that people on parole will be able to vote. 
um, since they are coming back into society and working and paying taxes. And 18 is that if you reach 18 years of age by the general election, you'll be able to vote in the primary. So it's a way of getting younger people more civically involved. I hope everyone got a chance to check out Comic-Con since it was free and virtual. And from what I understand, it's going to be, you can go to any of those panels. They're going to stay in perpetuity on that website. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And then uh, Rob, you're up next. Hi, everybody. Uh, Rob Howard. I'm a candidate for Oceanside Mayor. Um, my background is in labor and in actually working in the community. Uh, we've got a really nice thing going in North County because we're trying to duplicate what's going on down in South County. We're trying to turn these cities blue because in order for us to really do climate action, we have to do it together. It has to be a regional approach. Um, my background, I'm on the executive board for the Labor Council, and I'm actually president of my local union at San Onofre. Um, I'm excited because on August 10th, I go from working and running my union till I'll be on the campaign full time. Uh, I'll put my info in the chat. We'd we'll love to hear from you. Uh, Rob Howard, candidate for Oceanside Mayor. That's great. Thanks, Rob. And Merrin, I think that's everybody who had raised their hands. Oh, Michelle. Michelle has her hand ready? raised again. Yeah, Michelle raised her hand again. I'll unmute her. Yeah. Hey, hey Michelle. That's actually only because I don't have the ability to lower it from the telephone. Okay, Thank you, no, though. Yeah, no problem. Okay, great. Thanks. I've lowered that now. That's great. All right. Um, so thank, thank you, um, candidates, and uh, and uh, for all of that info. And we can uh, go ahead and jump into our program now. Um, so, um, John, I think we have some slides to to share. Yeah, I, th I think Gordy has. Uh, he, I made him a co-host, so Gordy, you should be able to go ahead and share. Okay. All right. Um, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Um, so um, yeah, we can just go ahead and jump in. Hi, um, my name is Carla Stabolt, and I'm going to be the MC today or the moderator. First, I just want to say thank you to the Point Loma and Ocean Beach Democratic Club for inviting CTC to present today. We really appreciate it. Next slide, please. Um, this is our presentation outline. I'm giving the introduction, and then Gordy, our CTC board chair, is going to be giving a brief history of racism. Then Dr. Darwin Fishman is going to talk about racism, terms, and definitions. Then I am going to tell you about my own personal experience and how my heart and mind were transformed regarding this issue. Um, next, we will hear from some of our CTC board members. They are going to personally give examples from their own lives, how they've been affected by racism. And then we have Yusuf Miller, as well as Julia Korber from Surge and they are going to discuss being a white ally. And Darwin is going to finish the presentation, giving you resources and organizations where you can get more involved if you choose to, and then I will moderate the question and answer session. Next slide. Um, CTC began in 2013 from a class on racism taught by our senior pastor at Point Loma Community Presbyterian Church. And the class led to a discussion with leaders from BAPAC, which is the Black American Political Association of California. And it started a monthly conversation, which is still going on seven years later. And we created a 501c3, and we are a diverse group of people embracing all ethnicities and all faiths or none. And our mission is to increase awareness and educate our community about the existence of, impact from, and solutions to hate and racism by promoting equity, justice, understanding, and tolerance. And our vision is a hate and racism-free society through transformed hearts and minds. And then the link below is our website. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, just um, you can send me an email, info at talkrace.org, and our website, talkrace.org, has a lot of resources, and it also lists our board members, our advisory board members, and mini-series and seminars that we have given over several years. 
Next slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, so again, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. And so I'm going to cover why we are here, why we think we're, uh, we're all interested in being here and a brief history of racism in America. So why we are here, uh, all these demonstrations that occurred recently, uh, the George Floyd solidarity, solidarity protests all around the world, as well as, as uh, protests here in San Diego. Why are we here? To learn more and begin to understand the pain of our black brothers and sisters to listen. Uh, this is something that James Baldwin wrote to his cousin and uh, his nephew it is. Uh, he says, this is a hundred years after the, you know, they were free, uh, civil rights, or in theory, the slaves were free. Um, you know, and I know that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom and 100 years too, and 100 years too soon. We cannot be free until they are free. So the we is the blacks and the they is, are the whites. Interesting perspective. So history of racism in America. So most of us in our schooling learned something about Jamestown, something about Plymouth. Uh, the first African-Americans, first Africans were uh, arrived in Jamestown in 1619. Interestingly, they were not uh, uh, slaves, they were indentured servants. So the, at that point in time, they would work seven years upon the completion of their service, they received freedom, were given land and provisions. Also, the majority of the indentured servants weren't Africans, they came from Britain. Uh, they were uh, a lot of orphans and criminals that were serving as the labor uh, in the South. It was not till 1660 that what we would call slavery really began. And uh, the, the black, the Africans were particularly favored for slavery for a number of reasons. One is because of where they came from, Western Africa, they had some experience with the crops that they were growing in the Southern states. It was considered that they were an endless supply of labor. Um, the laborers from Britain and Ireland were refusing to make the trip because it was so hazardous. Their darker skin of the Africans prevented them from blending in with the settlers. So when they would escape, it was easier to identify someone from Africa and get them back as uh, in their servitude. Um, and some of them brought this sickle cell anemia, which, was, which protected them from malaria. So they were um, seen as the, the most favored group to have. So in the late 1960s, there was a mass importation of black Africans or of Africans to be slaves. And they, they were no longer indentured servers, servants, they become property. By 1750, 20% of the population was African. So in 1776, we had this uh, war of independence and, and a revolution. By this time, most of the Northern states had out, outlawed slavery. They had their cheap labor from, from Europe. Um, they were really questioning the whole institution of, of slavery, but they had very limited experience with, with the Africans. The first abolitionists came in about, or was formed, the first organization against uh, slavery was formed in, 19, in 1775. They were moderates. They were thinking, yes, we want to end slavery, but it could be at, when they reach, uh, slaves reach a certain age or a certain date. And they uh, supported property rights. So they were going to compensate. They, they would be in favor of compensating the, land, the slaveholders for the loss of their slaves. So they opposed slavery, but not racialization. They were uncomfortable with these strange Africans and to put it bluntly, wish them to go away. So in 1789, after we'd won our independence, we had the constitution. And in the constitution, we addressed slavery or the, the slaves in three areas. 
uh, in one area, they were treated as semi uh, people. They were counted as three fifths of a person in the in counting population. Uh, and then the other parts, they were considered property. One of them ended the importation of slaves in 1808. And they allowed taxation because they were considered property on these slaves. And uh, in the other article four, section two, they talked about runaway slaves and the right of the owners to reclaim those runaway slaves. So in 1808, slavery importation of slaves was, was banned, but the practice continued until 1859. In the 1830s, we had a new breed of, of abolitionists. So uh, these abolitionists supported immediate uh, uh, freeing of the slaves without compensation to the owners. Um, they thought about colonization of the blacks. So they had the idea of exporting, taking the, the blacks and, and sending them back to Africa and setting up a colony there. And Abraham Lincoln actually talked about that when he was president. Um, so, so, uh, so that was what the new abolitionists believed. They still considered blacks to be inferior to white. In the 1840s, we had the potato famine in Ireland. So that brought uh, some poor Irish to the Northern states and again, gave them a good supply of, of free laborers. We had the Civil War because by this point, the North was, was against slavery. The South obviously supported slavery. Um, the blacks had, or the uh, North had very limited relationships with blacks. Only 3% of the population was black there. The South had the relationship and the slavery. So we had our civil war. Uh, in 1865, we had the reconstruction after the North won the war. That was really one of the highlights, uh, a bright spot, let's say, in our, in the, the, our history. Uh, and so because Northerners came down and they replaced the Southern leadership with, with the Africans with the blacks. And that worked well until the Northern leadership then went back to the North. And then we set up these, the Jim Crow laws, which basically gave um, equal, uh, you know, this equal but separate protection, which favored the whites again. And slavery was uh, redefined, so to speak, in what they set up was, was the sharecropping, which basically, put the, the blacks back into a role of really uh, similar to slavery. In the early 1900s, we had industrialization and something called the talented tenth. So with in industrialization, there was a need for, for labor in the North because there was a reduced amount of people coming in through, through immigration. So this was an opportunity for the blacks or many of the blacks then moved to the North. So for the first time, the Northern states and the Western states experienced an inflow of, of blacks and it didn't go well. They had, a, um, you know, they talked a good, good game, but when it came to the actually experiencing the socialization of blacks, there was a lot of, of conflict. It was the start of the urban ghettos. There was conflict over neighborhoods and jobs. The talented 10th was an effort in a philosophy developed by W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, he had this idea that in order to raise the, the capabilities of the black population, if we took out the talented tenth, as he called it, and work spending our time on them, they would then go and raise the rest of the population. So, um, the problem with that was is that that created this class, uh, a, a class within the black community. So you had the talented tenth who had been educated uh, and pulled out of the community. Many of them did not return, and and they got, became assimilated in the white. And many of those got assimilated into the white community. But it did lead to development of a number of of black leaders. Uh, during the same time, the Ku Klux Klan reached its highest membership of 
over 2 million because they saw as these black leaders were raised, that was a threat to the white community. They were uncomfortable and so that raised their, their population. Uh, in the mid 60s and mid 1900s, we had again this, the blacks moving into the north and so we had whites leaving the, the neighborhoods. We had the civil rights movement began and that was largely led by, by, black, uh, by blacks in the, uh, out of the black African churches. Uh, the churches were a place of empowerment for blacks. Their, uh, the direct action worked pretty well in the South, but their direct action did not work so well in the North. Um, in the, uh, 1954, we had Brown versus Board of, of Education, the outlaw of the separation um, uh, of the outlaw of equal but but uh, separate laws. Um, 1955, Rosa Parks took her bus ride. 1960s, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, voting rights of 1965. So almost 100 years after uh, the emancipation, we had these laws in place. And much of that was due to the raising up of this talented 10th and their leadership in, in these uh, movements. Uh, Malcolm X uh, had a lot of uh, protests similar to what we're seeing maybe today. And he sort of um, is an example of someone who got tired of waiting, um, as we could understand. So history of racism in America, a little bit of summary. So the abolitionist movement worked to end slavery and free slaves but did not unite Americans in a common community. Likewise, the civil rights movement worked to gain rights and freedoms, but it was used, but, and it had rhetoric talking about bringing us together, but it was unsuccessful in bringing us together. So the result of 400 years of racism in America gives us some of these statistics. Whereas the population of blacks is about 15% in the nation, 6.5% in California, less in San Diego. 25% uh, live in poverty versus 10% of whites. Medium income is low. Black men and women uh, um, form 38% of the state and federal prison system. There's been recent improvement, improvement in black statistics, but recession, natural disasters and pandemic hits the black community harder and lasts longer. Uh, black unemployment rate in June 2020, for example, actually went up, whereas for the rest of, of the US, unemployment rate went down. Darwin. On mute. Hello. OK, hopefully that worked. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gordy. Thank you, Carla. And thank you. Dem Club for inviting us, Point Loma OB. Appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm going to be brief, but actually really much more curious with engaging in all of you. I'm also going to assume that you know most of this material anyway that we're covering, certainly a history of race. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of my professorial thing in terms of background information. Um, tell me if there's any issues with this sound. All right, so let's go ahead. Uh, next slide. Um, next, yeah, just put them up. Uh, there should be a few of these. Origin of idea of race. Okay, yeah, that's good. We we'll stop there, and I'll just talk about. This. So, following what Gordy said, that what I do when I'm teaching race at San Diego State in sociology and criminology classes is I talk about the two different origins. One is uh, from science and then one is from colonialism. And what it connects fundamentally to what Gordy presented is that if you take the definition of race and racism from colonialism, then we're very much still stuck in it. It hasn't fundamentally changed into, on an institutional level. And that's really important because most people lose sight of that and they focus more on the scientific part. That has dramatically changed. The definition of race in terms of for science, and you can go uh, next screen. Next slide, yeah, thanks. Uh, is based on phenotypical differences. And so historically, race came from the physical sciences like biology. 
but biology, as we know, has officially disowned it. It's not a biological definition. They found, of course, once good scientific work was done, quality scientific work, there's more differences in what they were labeling as a race than there were between races. So those original designations, things like mongoloid, nigroid, and caucasoid, actually never made any sense for designating humans. So it's true, we are all humans. The problem is the baggage of the biological work is still with us. So if you say, for example, walked around downtown San Diego and you asked 20 people about race and racism, most everyone would get to a biological definition of race and racism in terms of talking about people's ancestry or talking about the way people look. But that actually, from a scientific standpoint, doesn't make any sense. Go next slide. Uh, what we do know is for social scientists, it's the social construction in the sense that if people believe it, then it is true. And certainly if it determines resources that people get, then it really, really is, does exist. And that's where you get to the uh, social construction of race. And that really means that, well, for social scientists, and you go to the next screen, we look at uh, five different races, one dominant white race in the U.S., and four minority races in terms of power relations, African-Americans, Latinx community, Asian-Americans, and Native Americans, indigenous population. You can go to the next slide. And we know this uh, for census, and thank you people like Ellen and Baypack for doing the great work on the census because in case anyone's not clear, this is a fundamental political fight about resources, and that's the key then for uh, how race is socially constructed and why power still is fundamental for it. It's not just a way that in that sense we view people or we act towards them. And that's what makes also race different than ethnicity. Ethnicity can include things like religion, it can include your nationality, but race is key because it does ultimately go back to the faulty understanding of biology and it becomes something you're locked into. So also sorry uh, our, for our titles, uh, a little problematic. You can't go from white privilege to white allies. You actually are always stuck with white privilege. For those of you that are part of the dominant race, you can certainly be a white ally in that sense. We'll get more into that, but that's by choice. Our racial designations don't change. Uh, with this, let me also just say for uh, the census, let me just say a real quick, um, deviate from it, just say a personal story. Uh, when I was a child, um, the census did a home visit with my family and my mom was home. I'm biracial, my mom's African-American, my father's Polish Jew. They had a, a really tough time with my brother and I. And this again, just on a highlight the political struggle, especially since we're going through this right now with the census. Uh, race, they wanted to put down mom, black, for my brother and I, but then with my father disclosing a Polish Jew, they wanted to change it to white, but we have the one drop rule, so we went, they, the census taker went with black. It's the same thing with religion. Religion should be by Christianity. It's your father. That wouldn't work. My father's Jewish. Judaism is matriarchal. It's by the mother. Um, mom's Christian. That didn't work, so we couldn't, my brother and I couldn't have religion. So that's why, again, the census is so important because that's literally our count or our miscount for who's in our society. And it doesn't surprise me, for example, that we're having a current struggle that all of you are very aware of, of for example, what to do with immigrants, undocumented people, and Trump wanting to remove them from the count. So that's why this is so critical. It literally determines the amount of resources communities will get, and it makes a huge difference. And that's also really important to understand that for current struggles about race and racism, how they go from things like census to the criminal justice system to education. Um, and the critical part really, again, is about power relations and it typically plays out through resources. Uh, next slide. Uh, for the um, designations for race, uh, for racial groups, part of the standard that we set, uh, speaking of social scientists is for historically oppressed groups. So African Americans um, and for Native Americans, in some respects, that's the easiest for us to think about the history of slavery, history of genocide for Native Americans. 
But what we also find, it's really important, if you look at, of course, following what Gordy said, if you look at the history, for example, of Asian Americans and the Latinx community on the West Coast, things like building uh, the train tracks were, were done by those communities, just like on the East Coast, that was done by African Americans. So a lot of that work is very similar, as well as also even when you get into things like lynchings. I had a friend that wrote a book about the lynchings of Asian Americans on the West Coast, like in the state of Washington. So those racial practices, and in that sense, were first honed with things like Native American community, and then African Americans were also then used for other racial groups. And that's also important then for understanding our history, and for that matter, our linked history in terms of minority races. Yep. All right, uh, next. All right, and then the part about uh, what is racism. Um, so the part that racism, and again, this gets to the thing of distinguishing it for ethnicity, is the policy component in that it has not just a personal element in that it's language that someone uses or an action that someone does, but state sanction and then institutionalized where it becomes structured becomes really critical. And that tends to be the part that we neglect. And we're going through a moment now uh, post George Floyd being killed by the police in Minneapolis where we're, for example, um, collectively taking more seriously the criminal justice system. And for that matter, the abuse and neglect that communities like mine uh, have received historically from it. And I think that's important uh, for understanding the work that we're continuing to do. And the last part I'll just say, we'll pick this up uh, also at the end when I talk about resources, is also the part about pushing boundaries. One of the things I think is fascinating, I'll put it this way for everyone to uh, think about. So many of these changes that you think about post Floyd, from my standpoint, and for a whole lot of black folks, the rhetorical question is, why now? It hasn't been, it's not like there hasn't been a case for all of these changes that have come now. Why did it take this moment to reach that in terms of on a collective level, as well as also for other uh, groups? Uh, like, for example, changing the name of the Redskins and finally dropping that. It's really fascinating in that sense because it hasn't been like there's been missing organized resistance to so many forms of these racism, like criminal justice practices. Uh, it's just extraordinary that, again, that it literally takes this killing as well as national rebellions from coast to coast before some of these changes are really uh, put into place and these demands are taken seriously. All right. I think I did that quickly enough. I'll turn it back over to my group. Uh, thank you. Hi, you guys. Um, I don't have any PowerPoint slides. I'm just really going to tell you a story and how I got involved um, in being an anti-racist. In 2013, I took the class at Point Loma Community um, Presbyterian Church on racism. And I took it because I grew up in LA and at the age of nine, I could see Watts burning from my home. And our school district was completely segregated after the Supreme Court decision on Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. So my all white, white my all white high school was ordered by the courts to integrate when I was a freshman. So when I was 14, I became a member, unfortunately, of the last white class at Inglewood High School. And there was so much racial tension at my high school. I mean, I was kicked, I was spat at, we had a murder on campus over an annual. We had Crips, we had Bloods way back in the late 60s and early 70s. And needless to say, I had some unresolved issues about race. And I never realized I had a privileged background until a few years ago. This is after you know, creating CTC, working with CTC. And it was during a board meeting and I was sharing about how I was not privileged because my paternal grandparents were so poor during the depression. My father, the youngest child had rickets because the family couldn't afford to buy milk. They gleaned lima beans in already plowed fields to feed their large, hungry family. So I did not feel like I was coming from a privileged background. 
And dear Mary Ann Watson, who is now late, um, she's an she was an African American friend and a CT bo CTC board member. So during this conversation, um, she was quietly tapping her forearm like this, just tapping her forearm. And I was explaining my lack of privilege and it finally hit me. She was giving, the ob giving me the object lesson that regardless of how poor my grandparents were, I still had an advantage because of the color of my skin. And later we were out to dinner with Marianne and Bobby and we went to Bobo's in La Mesa. And they were the only African-Americans in the entirely full restaurant. And she challenged me to think why there weren't more black people there. And she opened my eyes to the absence of people of color in my neighborhood, at restaurants, um, and also cultural institutions like La Jolla Playhouse, San Diego Opera. They just weren't there. So um, I challenge you to look around, look around your neighborhood, look at places you frequent, and ask, where are the people of color? And my eyes have been opened, and I hope this program today will help open your eyes just a little bit wider. I'm going to give you a little bit about my family's background and my white privilege, as well as the effects into institutional racism has had on real estate, justice, education, and health. My paternal grandparents and maternal great-grandparents all emigrated to the U.S. from Sweden, and they were allowed to enter the U.S. without a sponsor, without speaking English, and they homesteaded on Indian land that was given to them. Why? Because they were white. My father, a World War II veteran, benefited from the GI Bill, which paid for his college education, allowing him to land an electronic engineering job, designing radars for the military, including the radar on the Midway in San Diego Bay, which I can almost see from my house. Um, many African Americans and other people of color, also World War II vets, were not even told of the GI Bill and its benefits, or told they could not get a home in that particular area because of redlining, or they couldn't go to that college as that college excluded Blacks. So there was no greater instrument for widening an already huge racial gap in post-war America than the GI Bill. So that good job that my dad got allowed my parents to purchase a lot for $15,000 in 1957 with a VA loan in a very nice neighborhood in Los Angeles. And it appreciated in value. So he cashed out that house 40 years later for his retirement. And this area in LA was restricted to whites only um, due to redlining, which was literally a red line drawn on the map where whites could get loans and people of color could not. And today I live in Mission Hills in a home that was built in 1936. When we purchased that home 30 years ago for historical interest, I read the fine print in the old documents. I was mortified to read that my neighborhood was restricted. And I quote, Jews and Negroes could not purchase property in my neighborhood. So that home in 30 years has appreciated eight times what we paid for it. And just because of the accumulated wealth of our parents who helped us with the $20,000 down payment, which we did not have because we just finished our medical residencies. So the homesteading of my great grandparents, the GI Bill, the prior redlining of my family's homes and the accumulated wealth from restricted real estate are all examples in my life of white privilege, where I benefited personally from institutional racism. And there are racial inequalities, not just in wealth and real estate, but also in education, criminal justice, and health. And did you know that the original US naturalization law of 1790 limited naturalization to immigrants who were free white persons of good character? It took over 150 years 
to prohibit racial and gender discrimination in naturalization in 1952, three years before I was born. So the history that we've been taught has literally been whitewashed. Between 1619 and 1863, the US received 5% of the 12 million Africans kidnapped for the slave trade in the Americas. And that translates into 40 million slave descendants in the US in the year of approximately 2000. Conservative calculations based on minimum wage and a 2% interest rate estimate that each of the 40 million slave descendants in the US deserve $1.5 million per capita for their predecessors unpaid labor, excluding reparations. Affirmative action put in place during the civil rights era was helping to even the playing field and right past wrongs. But within one generation that has been whittled down by the courts and new laws, and now only in existence for federal jobs and projects in California. So please vote for ACA 5 this fall, sponsored by Dr. Shirley Weber to restore affirmative action in California, which was already mentioned by Michelle today. Um, many institutions in our society have racist effects, and here are some shocking numbers. Nationally, the Department of Education found that African American students are over three and a half times more likely to be expelled or suspended than their white peers. African Americans were 18% and Latinos 24% of this national sample but together they comprised over 70% of school referrals to law enforcement. The differential treatment filters all the way up into the adult criminal justice system where one in 15 African American men, one in 36 Hispanic men are incarcerated compared to one in 106 white men. In some major cities, half of all African American men are either in prison, have been incarcerated, or on probation. While some of this discrepancy is explained by, by increased crime and high density areas, much also results from discriminatory effects of justice institutions and racial profiling by the police. For example, the national campaign of the war on drugs began in the 1980s and it unfairly targeted high density inner cities, even though studies have shown that whites are three times more likely to use drugs than people of color. They just don't get caught in the low density suburbs. Another example of inequality in the justice system is the mandatory penalties for crack characterized by politicians as a black drug 18 times harsher penalties than for cocaine portrayed as a white drug. And this was fixed by Obama, but the damage was done. African Americans and Hispanics are also three times more likely to be searched during a routine traffic stop and twice as likely to be arrested and almost four times as likely to experience the use of force with encounters with police. We need our African American and Hispanic men to be treated fairly and justly by the justice system so they can be productive citizens doing purposeful work as well as being fathers and husbands and stable families and be role models for their young men and boys and girls instead of getting caught up in the endless cycle of jail and unemployment. So besides um, real estate, wealth, and criminal justice, uh, there is also inequality in our educational system. And because San Diego is segregated into rich and poor communities and the education and resources in these communities are not equal, our own San Diego Unified School District in 2012 paid $8,300 less to teachers serving in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods. This differential attracting the best teachers to the whitest schools 
was the second most discriminatory policy among the largest 20 school districts in the entire United States. And this is according to federal civil rights data collection statistics. Philadelphia, by the way, was number one. So San Diego followed Philadelphia being the second worst. Differences in access to the most skilled teachers, learning resources, and the best schools multiply the opportunities for white students and leave many Black and Latino students behind. If you're behind in high school, it's really hard to catch up. It's hard to get accepted to a competitive university, and that limits what professional training and eventually what jobs you can get. I'm a physician and medical schools and residency programs are heavily subsidized by the US government, again, benefiting more white people than people of color. During affirmative action, 2% of all medical schools, all medical students were African-American. And now without affirmative action, it is only 1%. 1% African American students in medical school. Culturally incompetent physicians or physicians with explicit or unconscious bias affect the diagnosis and treatment of people of color. Many studies have shown how physicians and other healthcare professionals absorb unconscious bias, leading to major racial disparities in health outcomes. To summarize, we as a multi-ethnic community in San Diego need to acknowledge the mistakes that our institutions have made in the past and continue to make in the present. We must proceed with haste to even the playing field, giving people of color a hand up and sharing the power that we white people have wielded so efficiently and effectively in favor in our favor for centuries. Each of us has an obligation to better understand the big picture efforts of our daily thoughts and actions within our own families, our social circles, our jobs, our schools, our criminal justice system, and our political choices. So please join me in using our white privilege to become a white ally. Thank you very much. Hey, Ellen, are you on? Yeah, yeah, I am. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Up. Can you see me? We can. We can hear you loud and clear. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, I'm so happy that um, uh, my uh, Continuing the Conversation advisory group is here, or, or continuing the, or is here today. Um, uh, Susan Piatto who is a Point Loma Democratic Club <laughs> um, a member and a very, a very good friend of mine, we've become very good friends, uh, asked about a, a, a group. Ellen, can you, can you, you have anybody that could come in and talk about white privilege? And I immediately highly recommended um, my, this special group that um, I'm just gonna say that God has put together. Uh, called Continuing the Conversation, the Eradication of Racism. And we've been at this for about seven years. Um, but I believe seven years we've been in preparation. I'm going to say this to the members. We have been in preparation for 2020, for the last seven years. And tears are coming down my face because I never realized that, um, that seven years of preparation was for what's happening in our in our in our country in our city today and as, as i was looking at all of the uh, presentations i was asked to talk about my own experience with racism here in san diego i am a native san diegan and um i'm a pastor's uh, daughter former pastor's daughter and i can tell you there were very a lot of instances where um i experienced as a young girl in white churches because my dad 
was a great singer on stages with the likes of Billy Graham. And I could sit in the audience and I could hear them reference my dad as, as a nigger uh, coming out the mouths of Christian people that I thought uh, they would reference him in secret. And as a youngster around five or seven years old, that always stood with me. Then my own experience growing up um, here in San Diego, I was one of the first bus busing students. And in the integration program, I was bused to Crawford High School. Um, and during that time, I was always marginalized, put in the, uh, the, the, low, uh, the low classes. They saw I had a gift to sew. So they thought that was gonna be my career. Um, Peg me as going to Ratner's a sewing machine factory. And it wasn't until some individuals from EOP, San Diego State came and said, no, you can go to college. And as a result of affirmative action, I'm gonna say that again, as a result of affirmative action, the door was open that I could go to college. Yes, I wasn't quite as prepared as I could have been because that was the educational system that uh, uh, Carla just shared with you. But at that time, affirmative action was a bridge uh, to preparing young people like myself to go to college. It wasn't an easy journey um, convincing the school system that I was college material. It took my mom going to the board and, and hiring an attorney to make that happen for me. But it was because of affirmative action that I was able to go to college I consider myself today a beneficiary of affirmative action. I then went on to work at San Diego State University under affirmative action, where I was able and instrumental to create opportunities for lots of African-Americans that as of today, 35 years later, that probably have all retired. But it was because of affirmative action and some of the goals that were in place at that time, I was able to implement those goals equitably and fairly, and as a result, it in uh, lots of African Americans hired at San Diego State University as a result of affirmative action. Also working in HR, I also know when Proposition 209 was passed, I saw personally upfront for myself how limited I was as an HR professional after, after the passing of Prop 209 that those kinds of measures and mitigation that I could do to implement and hire, train, promote, I saw all of it go away. I saw the white power structure decide to, to really just take it over. And we went back to the old days where we couldn't use race. Uh, we had to use socioeconomic. We had to use zip code. But we were using race as an as a as an even the playing field, and it wasn't about underqualifications. It was about qualifications. But we had a under affirmative action. You were able to ensure that there was a broader net of people of color, as it relates to the the applicant pool. And now with Prop 209 away, um, we were not able to do that any longer. Um, as a result of that, basically, um, our hands were tied. And here we are today, 26 years later, under that same system where Carla just talked about only 1% at, in um, the medical bill and also very, very, very small numbers. I challenge each one of you today, you Point Loma Democratic Club members and John and Susan, I love you all. Um, and you know, I'm very frank when it comes to talking, but I challenge every one of you today to look around Look around if you're a teacher who's in your classroom. Look around if you're a CEO of a company. Look around and see if you have, have African-Americans on your boards and your commissions. Look around in your jobs and see if you have African-Americans that are also in the workforce in your sphere of influence. And you figure out how to include people of color, particularly African-Americans in those circles. That to me is the, the, the biggest piece that white allies can do. When I, when I worked at San Diego State in Human Resources, God sent me white allies that literally 
gave me the courage, gave me the confidence, and poured in me the technical knowledges I needed to become successful. They gave me the tools. They didn't give me a pass, but they gave me the tools and they spent before work and they would spend after work and they would spend the weekends to ensuring that I was just as qualified and capable as my white counterpart. That was my own personal experience with white allies that came to my rescue in order to ensure that I was going to be a successful human resources professional at that time. And I give you that story because most of us, that's where we really experience racism. We experience on our jobs. We experience in our places of employment because that's where we all congregate. But I challenge you that if you're not working, if you're retired, go back and look at what's going on in those areas that you work in and be the voice, be the bridge, um, empower, look around as, as Susan and John do, they do with me. They always call me now, Ellen, wh where, can, where's a black, is there a black person that could do this kind of work? Hey, could you send their resume? Let's reach out. That's what I would encourage you all to do today. And I thank you for this time. And I really think, and I'm proud of our continuing the conversation, um, the eradication of racism, because seven years later, we are prepared to, to be in front of a wonderful group of individuals like this. And it's going to just take off and flourish. And we're now going to be able to change the face of San Diego because of how we prepared ourselves for the last seven years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. That was excellent. And Derek, you are you're up. You're online. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Um, first of all, I want to thank CTC. I know that um, it's a group of wonderful people. We all got together to start this. Uh, at that point, we didn't know who we are, who we were and where we were going with this and what it was going to look like seven years from now. And Ellen, I am totally with you 110%. We didn't know seven years later, we'd all be still in communication with each other. What I can say to you is that race, racism affects me each and every day and everything that I do. Um, I've been married 37 years, going on 38 years, same woman. We have four biological children, four adopted children. We went to buy a house one day in Spring Valley, California. And we bought this house. It was in a place called The Point. It sits up on a hill overlooking Spring Valley. A lot of folks may know where that is. But we bought this house. I had a, a, a sign on my car at that time. And it said real estate and what I did and how to contact me. I got a phone call the very next day from the neighbor who had just I had just moved in. The neighbor called me, asked me would I be willing to go for a cup of coffee. I say, well, you come over. I can come over there. I'd love to have a conversation with you, you know. So um, basically, um, he didn't want to come to my house and didn't want me to come to his. He says, let's meet down the hill at the coffee shop. Well, he, I went and I talked with him. I sat there for about maybe uh, 15 minutes, didn't know what the conversation was about. And he, I finally asked him, why am I here? He told me I was there because he wanted to let me know that his wife did not want any children living next door to them. His wife thought that my kids was going to tear up the neighborhood and that my kids didn't have any manners. Well, I raised my children the right way, but in his world, it was almost to the fact that you can't move in this neighborhood. You're not allowed to live in this neighborhood. And that was one of the biggest challenges I had because the biggest challenge was to keep my hands from around his neck, <laughs> okay? That was the biggest challenge. The second challenge was I had never been confronted by someone that told me that I could not live next to them and I'm in the real estate industry. I own a real estate company, a mortgage company, a daycare. I'm a business professional. I'm also the chairman of the board for the National uh, Association of Real Estate Brokers for the state of California. I am also the National Mortgage Lending Chair 
for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And I've been a director for San Diego Association of Realtors for years. But to say that racism doesn't exist, well, we all know that it does. It's just how does it exist? In my profession, real estate is a very, very important dynamic for equality. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of rules. Anyone ever heard of fair housing, fair lending, all those things, it's not fair. I don't care what they say. It does not truly indicate that things are fair. A lot of those things have been torn apart since this administration is in office. It's been taken away or diluted, should I say, the power isn't there anymore. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been torn apart, it's gone. So the, the, the leverage that we had to get into housing, where our numbers right now are at 41%, almost 42%, should I say, for Black home ownership compared to whites of 71%, is because of the rules that have been laid out. And not just in San Diego, but throughout the United States. The red line in San Diego is the 8 freeway. Everything south of the 8 is not as much value, whether it comes to health, whether it comes to education, whether it comes to real estate appraisal, they come in lower. The educational system is not as great as it is north of the eight. And a lot of families try to get north of the eight. However, the lenders have something called loan level price adjustments. If the scores are not where they should be, you get a, a slap on the wrist. You can't afford as much house. So there's so many techniques that are in place that in my daily life, that we, I have to deal with on a continuous basis. I have to fight harder to get a, a black person alone than a white person. I have to make sure that they're not being discriminated against by the underwriter, because it may not be the person who's signing the final loan documents to, that's discriminating, it could be the underwriter. So the education needs to go uphill. It cannot continue to stay where we are right now. I've looked at, and I'll share this with you, and I only had a couple of minutes to, to give you some information. But I want you to know that um, in housing, housing is so, so important to us, to us as a people and to you as a person. If there's no equality when it comes to lending, fair housing, equal rights, then there's not going to be an equality across the board. We need your help because you're talking to the banks. And, and you know, I want to go into one other thing here. No one mentioned so far that the banks own slaves. Chase owned slaves. Wells Fargo owned slaves because slaves were chattel property. So when you go back to it, it's a whole lot of underlying things that are systems that were put into place to keep us in a, a place where we almost need a hand out, but we should be getting a hand up. So with that being said, the last thing that I'll share with you is when you hear they're coming after your suburbs, they're going to take over your neighborhoods, your property value is going to go down. Those are words that have been used in the real estate industry for years to keep people from allowing other people into their community. Those are words, and, and I think Carla mentioned something about covenant conditions and restrictions when she said there was a covenant in place where people of other colors or blacks and Jews could not own that property. I still run across those things, but we know that they cannot be enforced, but they are there. I'm saying that to you because I too challenge you. I challenge you to come to, a C, to get with the CTC board, to come aboard as a, as to be able to help assist us in this fight, help to understand what we're doing. I've read Biden's policy on what he's gonna do for black Americans in this world, or in this nation, should I say. And not only black, but he's also going to make sure that there's a more equal playing field based off of his, his things that he's saying. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but what I'm telling you is all the things that were in place, they're gone for us. We need to make sure that the Democrats get out there and vote and get whoever in place, if it's Biden, and he's gonna be Biden, I believe. But these things that he have listed in here in his 36 page referendum or whatever you wanna call it, it looks real to me. It seems more right than wrong. So please, please, please join us at CTC. We're not saying who to vote for and all that. What we're trying to do is just change hearts and minds about how things have been and where we're going with it. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Derek Luckett. If you need to speak to me, 
just reach out. I can be found on Google. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Uh, that, that was really wonderful. Um, Yusuf and Julia, you guys are now on. Okay, thank you. I'm Yusuf Miller. And um, I'm going to start the first half of this presentation, then I'll pass it to my uh, surge ally, Julia, who I see is here as well. So um, I'll give it a, a start. Now, as you can see the slide here, it says, uh, if you are neutral in a situation of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. This is by Desmond Tutu. And this is such a real statement. And, it, and no matter what background you come from, this statement rings true all over the globe. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna center in on this subject with America. Now, before George Floyd in 2020, we had, as Dr. Fishman alluded to earlier, we've had issues like George Floyd for decades, for centuries here in the US. So let's take, for example, in 2014, uh, Eric Gardner, he, he said he could not breathe, I can't breathe, and he was uh, choked to death in New York. But not only New York, or not only a Tamir Rice in another state, not only these people, but here in San Diego, in 2016, we had Alfred Alongo in Chula Vista shot to death unarmed by law enforcement. In 2016, we had Sergio Wick in Vista shot 18 times unarmed by law enforcement. 2017, we had uh, Jonathan Cornell also in Vista shot to death by law enforcement. He was unarmed. And um, we have in 2018, we had Raul Rivera who was trying to commit suicide in Nestro and he was shot to death in a intersection. Uh, they, they, they say he was uh, wielding a knife and there was no way they could uh, arrest him. So they, I guess they just decided to shoot him to death. And the same year, Earl McNeil, unarmed, went to law enforcement himself. He knocked on the door of the law enforcement building and told them he needed help because he's having a crisis and he lost his life in police custody. Uh, Vito Vitale in Little Italy, Little Italy, uh, Vito Vitale also lost his life. He was a, uh, he had mental health issues as well as Earl McNeil and Raul Rivera, all three having um, mental health issues. So the question becomes, what was the catalyst to Earl McNeil that make people uh, concentrate and come out in this, this uh, large, large numbers? And I, my theory and a theory that a lot of people share is it's one of the silver linings of COVID-19. Of all the horrors that uh, COVID-19 has uh, raped upon people's families and our communities, one thing it did is it caused us to shelter in place and be confronted with our own biases when we see it on TV. Now, when uh, George Floyd was seen on television being uh, murdered as, as these other people have been uh, killed as well and have been on TV, it's been on the news, it's been on the press, it's been in the papers, but they had no way to switch on Dancing with the Stars. There was no way to switch on the baseball game, the football game, and everyone had to be confronted on their couch with their own biases, with their own lack of support in this issue that has been going on for centuries. So I think that was the catalyst that got people off their couch. And it's wonderful. I don't care how the white allyship came to fruition during the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement currently, I'm glad that it's there. But we should also understand how it got there so we don't go back into the mechanism of sitting on our couches when we have other uh, diversions from justice and, and, and oppression in our nation. So now all these people have gotten up off their couches, not only white uh, allies, our, our brown allies, our Asian allies, people have come out the woodworks supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, supporting George Floyd, and they have been, like I said earlier, confronted with their own biases. And they realize that it's true. I've been turning my head. I've been turning my face. While this was going on on my left side, I was turning my face to the right side this whole time over these centuries. And it has been unjust for me as a bystander. And that is exactly what this, uh, this quote from Desmond Tutu is applying. And whether they've read it or not, they felt Desmond Tutu in their heart. Desmond Tutu got them off their couches. They felt his statement whether they've never heard of the man himself or his words. So they got up off the couches. And what happened is a revival. There's nothing in this nation that is equivalent to this George Floyd movement, to this current Black Lives Matter movement. There is nothing in our nation's history that is equivalent. The only thing that we have 
so before I get there, so this this uh, this condition that they were living in, if you can go to the next slide, this condition that they were living in is the white silence. This is the this is the sitting on the couch. This is the watching it on TV, but it doesn't affect me. They're Americans, but they're not my type of American. They're not my neighborhood. They don't go to my school. This is that white silence, which was is compliance to the the issue going on. And I used to uh, always say that you know you have a problem. We have all have a problem in this nation, but the problem is not the bad people in this nation. They're not the problem. The problem is the person who sits by and allow it. Those people are larger in numbers than the people doing the right thing. They're larger in numbers than the people doing the wrong thing. The people who are sitting back on their couches allowing this to happen every single day and it is not their problem. This is the white compliance. This is the white silence that, that people are speaking about. It's happening in someone else's na uh, neighborhood. They probably deserve it. It has nothing to do with me. So if you could uh, send the next slide. The, the, there's a mathematic involved in white allyship. And this mathematic is, there are about, if I can round it, to 15% of African-American population in the US. And there's about, if I can round it, 60% people who claim to be white, non-Latino. White, non-Latino. So if you multiply every man, woman, and child in this nation, we would still not have enough votes without our white allyship, still. It's the mathematic that is absolutely true. And who had the wisdom of this math? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as you can see in this slide, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is walking down the avenue with his white allies, with his Jewish allies, with his Latino allies, because he understood that this problem is not only a universal problem, but you have to approach it in a systematic way. You have to approach it actually in a mathematic way. And there is no way, even if you multiply the population of all the blacks in this country four times, we would still be shy of the percent of white people in this country. So it's imperative that our white allies stand up, show up, speak up, vote right, and look at these issues that affect people of color and affect the change. It is not something that you can just sit by and say, okay, I have a clean moral conscience because at least I didn't contribute to the issue. No, that's not enough. It's never been enough, but it's especially critical that we know that it's not enough now. So we see the, the, the wisdom, the mathematic wisdom of Martin Luther King in the 60s to make some strides forward. If you can send this ne next slide, please. And we see that same cooperation going on now during the George Floyd. You see our white allies who got up off that couch, the ones who got out of the movie theater, they came off the beach, they came out of the parks, they came from the baseball game, the football game, dancing with the stars, and they marched in the streets and they said that they will not stand by anymore. They will not stand by any longer. Our youth, they're not in school. And they found that their real education was out on the street, out on the boulevard, at the corner, at the polls, at their city council, at writing letters to their mayors and their, their elected officials, they found that their real education on what's going on in America, especially when it comes to a quote unquote race relation, is something that they need to be involved at at every letter, le uh, level. And I tell them, if you're 15 or 14, don't think you're not involved, that you can't be involved in this issue. You can write letters. Every letter that goes to your mayor, every letter that goes to your city council, you don't have to wait until you're 18 or 19 or 20. You are involved in what they've been doing. They've been involved. They've been involved in discrimination against um, environment and climate and social and uh, employment and education. They've been involved in all these senses. And as you can see from this flyer, people just get up off the couch. And this same thing has been happening throughout San Diego and throughout its counties. Next slide, please. So with that knowledge about um, the white allyship and how important it is mathematically for people to show up and stand up for the issues that are going on with African-Americans and anyone in this country, I wanna turn over and share my time to my, my uh, great ally that has been working here throughout San Diego, showing up for racial justice. And we'll have uh, Julia, please uh, give us a breakdown of this organization. 
Thank you so much, much Yusuf. That's uh, quite the introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Julia. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I want to thank everyone for sharing their time today. I want to thank Point Loma and OB Dem Club, um, CTC, for bringing us all together this afternoon. Um, like Yusuf was sharing, uh, SURGE uh, San Diego stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice. It's an organization that uh, functions nat nationally uh, with local chapters. Um, so we have two different chapters here in San Diego. We have one in San Diego City proper, and we also have one in North County, San Diego. And SURGE as an organization um, formed um, around the same time that Black Lives Matter formed in order to create a space to educate, motivate, and coordinate um, masses of white people on the mission towards racial justice. And we do that through building accountable relationships with Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led organizations. Because um, just like Yusuf was sharing, um, we re recognize that um, without a broad consciousness of how white supremacy and anti-Black racism um, is detrimental to everyone in our society without waking up a lot of white people to that realization and all the different ways that they are able to take action, um, that we would not be able to see the changes that we want to see um, actualized. Um, so through developing uh, political education, putting together, you know, people power and resources, if that's showing up for different campaigns or policy proposals or protests, um, we ongoing educational opportunities, um, this is like what search is all about. Um, and I am going to put a link in the chat right now about a form that you can fill out to learn a little bit more about showing up for racial justice, San Diego. And um, I also wanted to um, reflect on some of the specific ways that we are growing in this time. We've seen a six times increase in our membership since May. Um, so we are so excited and motivated to get a lot of people sustaining on a lifelong commitment to racial justice. Um, and I really wanted to highlight what Dr. Fishman shared about how white privilege exists structurally. And so it takes a structural analysis and response in order to make those changes. And also what Dr. Dr. Stable shared, which is that as these systems of institutional power exist, they influence all of us individually. So we believe in joint internal work on doing racism in ourselves and in our communities, learning how to have those difficult conversations in our places of, in, of employment, in our different spheres of influence, as well as becoming aware of broader issues that we are able to take those strategic uh, structural steps. And you can also find us um, on Facebook and Instagram at Surge San Diego to learn about um, more opportunities to get involved in our upcoming events. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Julia. The the um, I just wanted to say a, a last closing word is that um, as we see this George Floyd issue going on from Minneapolis, we you recognize I, I ran off a list of names of things that are happening here locally. So I wanted to make sure that you realize and acknowledge that there are local issues, there are local George Floyds, there are local Tamir Rices that we need your help on. We need people to stand up and show up. Thank you again, Julia, and thank you, the Dem Club, for having us uh, here today. Perfect. Thank you, so Yusuf, and thank you, Julie. Darwin, do you want to close this up with resources and organizations? Sure. Uh, thank you, presentations. I'll just add the we encourage you to get involved in organizations. This is a list of some of them. And then also expand your agenda in terms of the issues you look at and you address and be proactive about it. Invite these organizations to your meetings, help them to help you to develop your policy. When Yusuf and I worked on banning the chokehold in San Diego, there were meetings we were not invited to. There were people that would not return our calls, but we were eventually getting San Diego successful in banning all neck restraints after three years of organizing on it. So there are these issues that we're working on now in the black community and we're not allowed to present with certain groups and it's not part of the policy discussions. So that's what Yusuf is referencing and I just wanna echo that. That's real critical. You have the websites, reach out to us, reach out to these different organizations and let's have discussions. And I know we've, uh, we're about five minutes over our time. Um, do we have five more minutes for Q&A? Would, would that be okay for everyone? 
Sure, of course, yes. Um, anybody who has a question, you're welcome to also put it in the chat um, because there might, uh, another member or listener might also um, know the answer as, as we've kind of been chatting along. Yeah, I think Marion, you got Michelle first with a hand up and, and Michelle, I'll unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Thanks. Mine is really quick. So not everybody has access to the chat nor to the websites. Can you please make sure that you always include like a phone number contact um, and that I can probably get from John or someone else. Sure. But, yes. but please uh, just be aware of that. Also, when you're doing your slides, as much as you can give a description of what's going on is really appreciated. Thank you. Okay, sure. Definitely. And we'll have this, this is um, also being um, streamed on YouTube. We can also um, email it. Um, we can provide slides with captions as well um, for anybody that needs that too. In this email list of, we can email this list of resources too, so you can distribute it to your members. That's great. And then Rob, you're next. No, I wanted to, um, first I want to say thank you all. It's, it's really, I mean, Many of you I know, but it's always good to hear because when I hear it going out, that means other people are, are really getting that information because it's one of those things you have to keep hearing it. I just wanted to, to, to throw the challenge out for, for the Democratic Party and the Democratic clubs to actually make this a staple of, of information, particularly now, because I can tell you without you know getting into all the particulars, as a candidate, uh, I am you hear the things that people tell you are uh, having grown up in the South and I actually teach diversity and inclusion at Edison. You hear things that as a candidate, I can't respond to how I would want to respond to them. And so I think the education is necessary. Are you all, you know, is this a road show we can count on if we have other clubs that want to, uh, to have you join them? Cause you know, you don't have to travel that far on zoom, right? We can, but I, I really would, would like to, to connect with some of the clubs I, I, and I do appreciate it. And, and offline, let's have a conversation about some of the things that, I mean, we talked about in the workplace, but in the political arena in San Diego, this is an area we need to, to start looking at because if you look at the population to the number of, of candidates, um, it's not just because people don't want to get into it. Uh, there's, there's more we can do to get an inclusive number of people. So I will, the, the question really is, are you willing to do it for, for the number of clubs? Um, and I wanted to thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank, thank you for those comments. And CTC would be honored to give this presentation or a similar presentation to other Democratic clubs, other um, institutions in San Diego. We would, we would be honored. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? No. Okay. I'm. Um, I'm not. I'm not seeing any uh, chatted uh, to me, or um, I don't think to anybody else. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, thank you. Um, also, yes. Um, in terms of the other Dem clubs, um, I will email the others. Um, that you are available for speaking opportunities. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that we've seen some um, some similar program um, this this month, and thanks to Susan on that um, at the Women's Club too. Uh, but of course, um, yes. Um, so uh, I um, I'm also uh, going to ask uh, Ellen, how can we help uh, passing ACA five this November? November. So um, some of you guys might not be uh, that it's, uh, it's going to repeal Prop two hundred nine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ellen, um, I told you that the you know about you about that to um, how to enlist some more people to help. Yeah, okay. Yes, um, uh, it, uh, Proposition sixteen uh, would repeal uh, Proposition two hundred nine and reinstate affirmative action. It will be on the November twentieth ballot. Um, so uh, we're on a. 100 day journey uh, to November. And the way you could help us is, is by encouraging your friends and families uh, to vote uh, to support it. It is written 
Proposition that historically in 1996, Proposition 209 was written uh, very tricky. Um, it was mis it misrepresented the intent of uh, the bill at that time. And this time it's written very clear uh, under the leadership of Dr. Shirley Weber and also Eva Patterson. I will uh, send to the to Susan and John. There's going to be a virtual uh, webinar on August the 5th because the key piece and we lost we uh, lost Proposition 209 passed by a very small margin and it was about messaging. So this time around, we are gonna be sponsoring messaging town halls and educating the masses of voters uh, so they really understand it's data driven and fact driven and it's not emotional driven. And yes, I will say this, that our biggest challenge is coming from uh, the Asian community, not all Asians. We have lots of Asian groups in support, but we have, an, we have the Asian community that has already put millions of dollars into ensuring that Proposition 209 uh, um, uh, fails. And this time, uh, we want to make sure we have the right messaging and we understand based on data and facts that in fact some of the data and facts that Carla articulated is a part of the messaging and the rationale for the re, uh, institution of, of affirmative action. So I'll send that information out. Uh, we're being very strategic. Um, you could give uh, I'll send you the link to give to the web uh, give to the campaign. It is a campaign and it's a movement. And we need all boots on the ground to help us get uh, the, um, the repeal of um, Proposition 209 through Proposition 16. Thank you. Do you have the time for that, Ellen? It's Michelle. No, I don't, but I will send it to Susan. Thanks. And she awesome. Can yes, can I get that up? Or you can let me know directly. But just, I also want to have a direct dial in. Thanks. For the city of San Diego, there will be uh, on the ballot the new CRB, a vote for replacing the current community review board on, uh, police practices with a new commission. And I would encourage everyone to vote yes on it. It's something that, especially south of the eight, folks have been organizing for and clamoring for for years, having a new CRB. Thanks. Yes. And um, we'll do, um, a, as it gets a little bit closer to the election, um, we'll put out some more information on all of these as well, um, just as a reminder and everything. Um, all right. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, uh, we're going to seek into reports now. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, President's report. Um, Western Service Workers Association is um, still soliciting uh, donations. We typically give to them uh, this year. Uh, they definitely uh, still are in need of funds, resources. Um, you, uh, we'll send out information of how to contact them directly for those of you that um, are not in the, the loop with Western service workers um, already. Um, yes, right here, um, drop-offs. Uh, and yes, since we're not having the barbecue, we do still want to provide donations for them. Uh, we can organize to pick things up. Uh, from anybody who would like to donate anything, or you can call Western Service Workers directly or volunteer. Um, all right, and so um, I'm told John does not have a report, so um, I'll hand over to Angela for Treasurer's Report. Hi, so um, as of June 30th, 2020, we had $9,600 in our checking account. Uh, we've made some donations to civic organizations where the checks have not cleared yet. And when that happens, our balance will be approximately 8,500. Uh, one of those outstanding checks is actually to the Committee for San Diegans for Justice, um, supporting the uh, initiative in San Diego. Um, as of today, we have 124 members of our club. For those of you who have not 
renewed your membership or if you want to become a new member, if you go to our website, um, the Point Loma Democratic Club website uh, and click on membership, it takes you to a link that you can become a member. Um, and we will in the coming months uh, make additional donations. And we obviously had some very good um, suggestions today. So we'll be looking at that as well. Um, and that's my report. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, we also, um, do we have uh, any uh, old business? I don't think so. Um, any new business anybody would like to raise today? All right, uh, hearing none, uh, we'll go ahead and um, keep this for you adjourned at um, 531. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers. If you would like to screenshot all of the stuff that's in the chat, um, if you'd like to screenshot the screen uh, right now so you can look up uh, um, some, of the, some of the resources that were mentioned today, please do so. Um, you're also welcome to email any of us that are affiliated with the club uh, and we will be putting some more information out uh, with our newsletter as well. Um, I would love to have other uh, Dem clubs have uh, this presentation or a similar one too. Um, so thank you so much um, to everybody. Um, excellent, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome, thank you for inviting us. Really thank you, thank you so much. Um, and um, yes, so I guess we're adjourned and um, have, a, have a, a wonderful rest of your weekend everybody. And, I, um, and again, thanks to all for attending. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Yes, we can. Oh, we, we can all mute. We can clap for the present presenters. We can say, yay. Great job. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Hi, Yusef. I see you're still here. That was good. I was trying to get out when you guys started clapping. I was like, oh, great. Good, good thing it took me so long. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Anytime. Yep. It was excellent.